Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. 30 years ago. They say their face was battered, her hair was torn out in chunks. Four girls went into the woods. This was a place that I swore I'd never come back to. Only three came out alive. While you held a knife in your hands, she gets her hands tied behind her back. At that point, you knew we were going to kill her. Not really. She was our friend. What would you tell Missy's family when they found out it was you? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by, Dr. Phil. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. In five, four. I am not giving up on you. Go, Dr. Phil. a disturbing trend in the news and I know you guys have seen this teenagers that are murdering their own best friends two cases recently shocked the nation you'll remember them take a look it is a chilling murder. A teenage girl is stabbed to death, and the two people charged are her two best friends. Skylar Neese disappeared from her Star City home in July 2012. 16-year-old Rachel Schoten admitted she killed her. Now her co-conspirator has done the same. Sheila Eddy has pleaded guilty to Skylar's murder. 12-year-old girl was stabbed in broad daylight. Police tracked down two girls. Both knew the girl who was found stabbed and are in custody. Investigators say the two middle school age girls committed this crime to please the fictional character and story Slender Man found on the internet. Geyser and 12-year-old Anissa Wire are charged as adults with attempted first-degree intentional homicide. They're accused of stabbing their classmate 19 times and leaving her in the woods. You know, I, we are left wondering why and how this could happen. And I'm asking myself, where are their parents? Who's setting the moral compass for these people? Well, today, we're going to talk to a woman, a woman who lived it. When Karen Severson was a teen, she and two of her friends lured 17-year-old Missy Avila to a spot in the woods that would become her grave. That day, four girls walked into the forest, but only three came out. 17-year-old Missy was murdered. Her body was later found in the remote Big Tahunya Canyon area, and it would be almost three years before police would identify her killers. When a third girl, Eva Churambolo, confessed to the police that she had been in the car with Severson and Doyle when they told her they killed Missy Avila. This is Karen Severson on the right and Lori Doyle, Missy Avila's best friends. The two girls who prosecutors say lured Missy into the woods and killed her because they thought Missy was trying to steal their boyfriend. After the murder, Karen Severson stayed very close to the Avila family and was very vocal about finding Missy's killer. Severson and Doyle were found guilty of second degree murder. The two were sentenced to 15 years to life. You know, when you hear these stories about these friends that get together and then all of a sudden they just rear up and, and kill one of them, one of their best friends, you wonder, what's the anatomy of the crime? Who, what are they thinking? And it is very rare to hear from a female who participated in the murder of the friend. Karen was just 17 years old when this crime occurred. And all of these years later, she is here to talk about that deadly day. We headed toward Tahunga Mountains. All three of us believed that Missy was promiscuous. We let her know, we know what you've been doing, we know who you've been doing. I had years of resentment built up. We were bullying her. Laura said, hey, let's take a walk. And this is when things started getting a little weird. We went down a trail and Missy stopped, sat on a rock and said, that's it, I'm not going any further. I thought, okay, well, good luck getting a ride home. I cut some of Missy's hair, and so did Laura. Missy didn't cry, but she did cuss us out. After that had happened, Eva started to walk back up the trail towards the cars. I followed, and Laura and Missy didn't. I heard some arguing and yelling. I watched as Laura was slowly backing into the creek. Laura was telling Missy, come on, come in here, Missy, come on. And Missy just stood there and cussed her out. 
And in that split moment, I looked at Missy, and I just listened to her cockiness. And then she would look up at me like, well, aren't you going to do something? And I just walked back to her, and I pushed her right to Laura. Laura had gotten her down in the water and was straddling on top of her. And uh, Missy's hands were still tied. Laura just grabbed her by the back of the shirt. Laura pulled her up. And I locked eyes with Missy. And in that moment, I made the worst choice of my life. I turned my back. I don't even think I wanted to help her. I was just so done. And I left. I was her hope. I can honestly say, you know, my hands didn't kill her. My hands didn't hold her underwater. But then I turned my back. My heart killed her. Okay, so... Karen, you, the, the, the four of you were friends. Right. And Missy was much smaller, right? Right. And you said you were kind of her bodyguard. You would stand up for her. You would, if, because you said she would uh, get crossways with other people and one thing and another, and they would come after her, and you would stand in the gap. You would fight her fights for her. You right. would do all of that. Right. Uh, but you started feeling used by her. Yes. And that made you resentful? Yeah, over time it did, yeah. Yeah. So on this particular day, when you guys got together and went to the woods, did you know you were going to kill her? No. You didn't know you were going to kill her that day? No. I thought we were going to confront her. For about what she's what? been doing. About her promiscuity, cheating with our boyfriends, you know, just being a little loose, fighting her battles for her. We were just going to confront her. And why would you need to go to the woods to do that? Well, we weren't supposed to go to the woods. I was supposed to meet uh, there Laura. There were two cars. There was two cars. I had Eva in my car, and Laura had picked up Missy mm -hmm. and told me to meet uh, her at a park called Stonehurst Park. Mm -hmm. So Eva and I arrived at the park and Laura wasn't there. And so as we started to leave, um, Laura pulled up, came up the road and motioned at us to follow her, turn around. And I did. And I didn't know we were going to go up there, although that was an area we partied often. So it wasn't real unusual to go there. It was kind of inconvenient, I felt, you know, time-wise, but it wasn't unusual, and we just followed. Okay, so you all get up there, and you start all picking on her mm -hmm. right away. Well, yeah, once she got out of the car, yeah. Well, well, you started screaming at her to get out of the car first, right? Laura did, yeah. Everybody, well, everybody was yelling at her eventually. Not to get out of the car. Yeah, eventually, yeah. Not to get out of the car. That was Laura getting her out of the car. But she gets out of the car. Yes. And, and we, she sits down. Well, no, she was standing there with us. Uh huh. And, and we started, yeah. And we started. what were you yelling at her? Just telling her about herself, telling her that we know that she's sleeping with so and so, and we know what she did. She was caught coming out of Laura's boyfriend's house, and we were aware. We were just pretty much bullying her and confronting her and letting her know that we knew. Yeah. That's what we were doing. We were we were punks. Yeah, so at some point she's sitting on a rock and she gets her hands tied behind her back. Right. Laura decided, let's take a walk, and Missy proceeded to walk. Laura was with her. Uh, Eva and I followed, and Missy stopped. At, at that point, you knew we were going to kill her. N not really. Okay, you're I tying a girl's we hands her. behind her back. Not that we were going to kill It was Missy. This was never discussed. So you took the knife and went over and sawed some of her hair off, too. Yeah, absolutely. We all did. Yeah. Did you ever try to stop them from tying her hands behind her back? And no. think, I'm not going to cut the girl's hair. This is my friend. I'm not going to cut her hair. No, I didn't. The prosecutors say that this was a well-planned torture and execution of this girl. Her hair was torn out in chunks. Her neck was submerged beneath a hundred-pound log. And later... How do you say sorry to somebody that you ultimately betrayed? Hardest day. That was the hardest day of my life. So then it gets really bad. 
Right. Okay. And at some point, Laura has her... Who, Missy? Yeah. Well, at some point, Eva, after this haircutting incident, Eva said she's, she's done, she's going to leave, and so she started to leave. I began to follow Eva, and Missy and Laura were still there at, at, at near where we were, near the stream. Who pushed her in the creek? I did. I pushed her in. Her hands are tied behind your back? Right. Her hands are tied behind your back, and you push her into the creek. How did you I do that? I pushed her to Laura. And Missy started cussing her out. That's when I was following Eva. I turned around, and Missy was just standing there cussing her out. Same, same stuff. Same, so she just same happened thing. to be standing in the creek. Who, Laura? Uh -huh. No, they were on the on. They weren't in the creek. They weren't in the. How'd she wind time. up in the creek? She was near it. And then when I went and I pushed Missy, and those two went into the creek. Laura and Missy both kind of wobbled. Missy fell. Laura straddled her. So she's face down. Yeah, after she, yeah, after she fell. As I was leaving, she said, hey, give me that. And she pointed at something. And it was like a makeshift walkway, kind of like a kind of damn little walkway. And it was a piece of log sticking out. I didn't see the entire log. It was m mainly underwater. And I didn't want to go grab it, so I went over, and with my foot, I dislodged it, and it went right to where Laura was. Yeah. So you pushed the log over to I her. just, yes. Uh huh. And what'd she do with that log? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. She. You're, you're telling me you don't know. You, you you went through the trial. Well, I know what happened after. I didn't know at that time. I could tell you what happened afterwards, mm -hmm. but I don't know what happened at that moment. I left. Because the prosecutors say that this was a deliberate crime. That it was well planned torture and execution of this girl. Of course, they're going to say that they're prosecutors. They say that uh, that. You and Laura accused Missy of having sex with your boyfriend. We all did. That you shoved uh, Missy's head into an eight-inch stream, that hikers found her, mm -hmm. and her hair was torn out in chunks. Her neck was submerged beneath a hundred-pound log. Okay, I don't know about her neck being submerged. I know that there was something on, like, the mark What's in the court record? Yeah, it is. I have the autopsy report. Yeah. And it was, it was mainly on her back, I guess. I wasn't there for that. I left at that time. Well, that's what you say. At a minimum, you pushed the log over Absolutely. to her. Absolutely, I just That she wound up bashing her with. But I don't, like I said, I left. Okay, uh, do, and do you, do you emphasize that as a point of defense? No, I don't. You know what, I was there, Dr. Phil, I was there. Because it I sounds like her. you're trying to trivialize your involvement. You're I, like, oh, hey, I didn't God, know, I left. No. I I'm left. being honest. Because it sounds to me like you no. showed up, you took this girl into the woods, you no. bullied her, you washed some tire hands behind her back while you held a knife in your hands, you went over, cut mm -hmm. her hair off, mm -hmm. you followed her back there, you shoved her towards a girl who put her into a creek, never then you beat. started She's pushing a log over to her with your foot, at least according to you. Well, there was no way. I, funny thing that testimony is I was never wet. It's amazing how, you know, how could I be dry? I'm not denying anything. I was there. I cussed her out. I was a bully. I was mean. I had been her bodyguard for years. I had defended her. I was resentful because I felt that she used me for years. And here I was at this time when I could have helped her like I've always done. And I made a choice to turn my back. That is more disheartening than had I stuck a log on her. It's mm. harder for my heart to sit here and tell you and all these people. They can't even match the music. They can't even rap. They're the black producer. Now they want to crack the new shit. They just want to act that I'm back the new kids. They can't even match the music. They can't even rap. They're the black producer. That I turn my back on my one-time best friend. Yeah. I would rather sit here and tell you, yeah, I helped with this log and I put it on. That would be easy for me. Yeah. But then after easy. that, so whatever happened there, mm -hmm. you... And your two-year-old daughter, did you move into her house? No, I did not. Did you go help her family look for the body? Absolutely. I was her friend. I, we didn't look for a body, no. What did you do? So I incorporated myself back into their family because if I was not there, it would have been abnormal. And so I was so high on drugs, so full of alcohol, I would do anything 
to make sure I failed Missy. I didn't want to fail her family. That was a sick obligation my 17-year-old mind had. So here's what the prosecutors say, and you, you say they're just prosecuted, but I'm just going to tell you what they said. They said you and your two-year-old daughter moved into Missy's mom's home. You volunteered for years to hunt for the killer and help this family. No, that's incorrect. How was it that you were so morally corrupt that at this time, if we just take your version of the story, that you just followed along and... No, I was there. Did, I drove up there. You did cut her hair and you did push the log over and then left and have no idea what happened with the log after that. Um, but that you were a party to this and you spent 23 years in the penitentiary for it? 23 right? and a half. 23 and a half years in the penitentiary for it. So they apparently thought you did something of importance. Absolutely. Um, as you look back on this, how were you so morally corrupt that this was okay? with you at the time that this wow. that this that this was something that that you didn't say you know what i no, no way i what what the hell are you doing tying her hands behind her back i'm out of here i want no part of this you're right what what what, what was wrong with you that you were that broken that you didn't do that there's a list you want a list <laughs> no. no i just want an answer you know the truth, how could I get to that point? I was full of anger, hatred, bitterness, resentment. I had an identity crisis growing up. There are a lot of contributing, fa contributing factors in my life that contributed to this. Was it Missy? No. There was more to my life. And here's the thing. When it came time for this to happen, and we were up there. Now, here's the thing. We were mean girls. We were bullies. And bullies are pack animals. When one started, we fueled the fire to the next. Individually, we wouldn't do this on our own. I don't believe either one of us. But you were the bodyguard. You were the one that fought I the was. fights. I fought, I fought a lot of fights. I did. And I was tired of it. I was tired of so it. So how are you drawn along by these other girls? You were the you were the alpha dog in this. Why? Actually, how are you drawn I wasn't along the by the alpha di dog? We, I was you drawn fought along. The fights? We were all friends. I fought the fights for Missy. Yeah. You know, not not on Laura and Eva, and we were all friends, and we all went together collectively to confront her. We the plan wasn't to go to the mountains. That was an afterthought when Laura was driving by when uh, Eva and I. We're waiting at the park. All right, we got to take a break. Next, back to the scene of the murder. Karen walks us through the park where her best friend, Missy, took her final breaths. This is the mountains where the scene of the crime happened. Missy loved it up here. She'd say, hey, let's go up to, you know, Vogel Flats. I swore I'd never come back. And later, what was your reaction when you found out she was dead? Shame, the guilt. Did you feel responsible? Oh, hell yeah. When I met Missy, when I was about seven, we had fun together. Barbies was our favorite thing. We were both a little reserved, but together we had this boldness and confidence. We gave each other strength and courage. We were a force to be reckoned with. She got me and I got her. We laughed continuously. We were two peas in a pod for, for many years. For three decades, Karen says she has been haunted by the memories of what she did and didn't do that fateful day. She took us back to the scene of the crime. This is Big Tahunga Mountains. This is the mountains where the scene of the crime happened. Almost 30 years ago, this was a place that I swore I'd never come back to. Missy loved it up here. She'd say, hey, let's go up to, you know, Vogel Flats. My mind is just flooded with the vision. I remember hearing a lot of Missy kicking, water splashing. She looked at me. You know, when I looked at her, my God, what was Missy thinking? You know, I can't even imagine. God, the fear. She trusted us. She trusted me. I hate what happened. I hate that I was part of that. 
God, if I could do that over again, this so would have happened. Why do you think the prosecutors chose you to describe as the ringleader? Well, I was the closest to Missy, and her family knew me. Her family didn't really know Laura. Her family knew Eva a little bit. Eva had lived with them prior to this. Um, but I had been there since we were young. They, they knew me. I was always there. I was her bodyguard. Did you ever misdirect the family that an ex-boyfriend may have done this or anything like that? Did you ever do anything to point the finger away from you? Um, yeah, I got involved in stuff, absolutely. I didn't give names. When, they, when names were said, I never, never squashed it. I never said, no, it couldn't be them. How did they feel and react when they found out that you, who had come back to them and befriended them and supported them and said, yeah, let's do whatever you have to to find who did this, let's do whatever. What was their reaction when they found out it was you? I wasn't there when they found out, but I can imagine very... Have you ever talked to them since? No. No. Never? Talked to them, no. Yeah. Do you they... think they feel a sense of betrayal? Absolutely. My God, yes. I betrayed them. Because we invited them to be here for this, and they said, absolutely not. Right. They said, we... We have no problem with you talking to her and doing this because I frankly said I won't do this if they don't approve. Mm -hmm. I, I won't have this discussion. I don't want to open this wound for them. I will not do it if they don't approve. And they said, no, it, it's okay. We, it's okay. Do that. And they said we, we may respond to what she has to say right. uh, after at a separate time, but we, we don't want to be there while mm -hmm. she's there. We don't want to hear what... We don't want to talk to her. We don't want to interact with her. Right. I walked up those steps, and her mother, she came out of that house, and she grabbed my neck, and she said, Karen, if you would have been there, this would have never happened. So that mother found comfort in the arms of the girl that murdered her daughter. And later, your parents didn't teach you it's not okay to tie a girl's hand behind her back and cut her hair off with a knife? I didn't care. How did you find out Missy was dead? Because you say you left. Well, she never showed up. What did you think? Did you think that they just wrestled around in the creek for a while and everybody went home? I didn't think about it. I didn't want to think about it. This was my friend. This was something that never happened before. You know, so I didn't think about it. Every time the phone rang, I prayed it was Missy. Every time, that, you know, I would hope that she would be walking down the street. And she never did. And when I found out, her grandma called me. And her grandmother said, did you read the paper? Because I had asked Laura and I had asked Eva, what happened when I left? And neither one of them told me. Each one told me a little bit. Well, Eva left before tell. you did, right? No, I left. You said she's done. She said I'm done. No, she saw, she went up the up the to the trail, and I followed. But then I heard Laura and Missy arguing, so I turned around. And at that time, with Laura and Missy arguing, and and Missy was cussing her out, Laura was cussing her out, and Missy was looking at me like, you know, come on. And I just I I had enough. I had enough, and I pushed her to Laura because Laura was telling her, come here, come on. And Missy was standing there discussing her. So I pushed her. Now then, when, after the whole incident, when I went to leave and, the, and I dislodged that log to, towards Laura, I left. I was the first to leave. Eva testified to that. Everybody knew that I left first. I cannot account for what happened when I left. Yeah, but you were held to account for what happened before you did. Absolutely. So what Absolutely. was your reaction when you found out she was dead? The worst case scenario, the worst nightmare you can ever imagine had come true. The, the shame, the guilt, I, I can't even put it into words. Did you feel responsible? Oh, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I did. Because I had, I had been her bodyguard. I had protected her. Mm -hmm. And at this moment, I didn't. I was, I was, I was tired. I didn't. And somebody else is, is cussing her out. Somebody else is cussing her out. I'm cussing her out. So what'd you tell Missy's family when it was found out that she was dead? But I, when, when, when it was found out? When, well, when they found out, like I said, the grandma, her grandma called me mm -hmm. and said, did you read the paper? They found Missy. And I said, no, I didn't read the paper. And she said, come over. And I heard Missy's mom in the background screaming. You thought they knew? I felt I knew they knew. And they kept telling me to come over. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. And I went there and I walked there and I walked to the steps and I walked up those steps and her mother, she came out of that house and she grabbed my neck and she said, Karen, if you would have been there, this would have never happened. I was there and it did happen and I couldn't tell them that. How do you say sorry to somebody that you ultimately betrayed, who you used to save all the time? Mm -hmm. Hardest day, that was the hardest day of my life, when she came out and the one person she trusted was there and participated. And when I believe in my heart, I was responsible. So that mother found comfort in the arms of the girl that murdered her daughter. Yeah. Sick as it is, yeah. Well. And you've been out of prison for how long? Almost three years. And so now you live with this for the rest of your life. I will always live with this. Okay. Next, what Karen says she wishes she knew when she was a teenage girl about to participate in a crime that would change her life forever. And at this point, you have a very different perspective of this now than you did then. You, um, you betrayed your friend, you betrayed your friend's family, you betrayed yourself, you spent 23 and a half years of your life in prison, mm -hmm. and now you spend the rest of your life with the burden of that choice. You know, what do you think when you see these headlines today of these kids that go out and girls stabbed 19 times in broad daylight by two of her friends with this pack mentality. I think it has to stop. It has to stop. There's no reason for this. Where were your parents when all this was going on? When you're out fighting all of these fights, you're a girl. What are you out fighting fights for? They were, were they were after school fight. Well, when I was 12, I fought a fight for Missy. But what are you? Well, where were your parents? They were they were there. They were they were at church. They were trying to get me into church, back into church. They were trying to get me to go to counseling. They were trying to do everything they could with me. But your parents didn't teach you it's not okay to tie a girl's hand behind her back and cut her hair off with a knife, even at that point. There was nothing your parents had instilled in you that said, right, wrong, this is wrong. Oh, they instilled it in me, but I didn't care. I'm not going to make excuses. I didn't care at that time. Is there anything your mother or father could have said to you at the time that would have made that not okay? I think the best thing that could have been said to me at that time was somebody with experience. Somebody that could say, look, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. I mean, my mom was the type that would say, don't use drugs, it'll kill you. My mom never lifted a drug to her mouth in her life. So the experience she had, to me, was false. 
Now, if a drug addict came to me and said, don't do it because look what's going to happen. You're going to get tracks on your arm. You're going to OD maybe. And I would understand that. My parents couldn't tell me something that they've never been involved with. They couldn't. They didn't know what I was doing. I would go outside the household and do this. I didn't fight in my neighborhood right there in their front yard. Mm -hmm. I w they, they didn't have a clue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you'll have the chance to be that voice of reason. I pray that I am. At trial, Eva testified as to the events that day. Uh, Eva uh, Cherambola was not charged or convicted of any crime. She testified for the state against the other two. Next, she has been one of the most talked about guests all season. See how she's doing after the break. I just wish that I would die in my sleep so that I would not be a burden to my family anymore. What do you think's going on here? Everything is you, you, you. The holidays should be a time of hope and happiness, but for families, children, and the elderly struggling with hunger, it continues to be a time of need because hunger hurts more during the holidays. Feeding America is the nation's leading domestic hunger relief organization, feeding 37 million Americans, including 16 million children who may not know where their next meal is coming from. You can give the gift of meals this holiday season. Every dollar you donate helps provide nine meals to men, women, and children facing hunger in our country. Visit DrPhil.com to find out how you can help this holiday season. Just six weeks ago, I met Shamita who said she had been diagnosed with more than 70 medical and mental health conditions and prescribed more than 80 medications over the past 10 years. She said she was in so much pain she could barely get out of bed for more than two hours a day and stayed in her room decorated with Hello Kitty memorabilia. But her sister Dana believed that Shamita was fabricating her issues purely for attention and told me her sister was destroying their entire family. You'll remember this. When I found out that I was ill, I felt like a failure. I just wished that I would die in my sleep so that I would not be a burden to my family anymore. My sister's illnesses are consuming our lives. It's destroying our family. We don't know what to do anymore. My sister is always pill popping. I'm so nervous. I need to take a Xanax really bad. Is this your medication box? Yes, that's, that's, my, that's what I live on. You've got 72 diagnoses in the last 10 years. Do you think that you're medicated to the point that it puts you in kind of a fuzzy zone? No. I'm, I'm not on but one antidepressant. You sound medicated 24-7. In the past 12 months, I've seen approximately 35 doctors. I think my sister is severely miserable in her life. I've accepted I'm a disabled person. No one else has. What do you think's going on here? Everything is you, you, you. Why would I want to make these things up? I'm in horrible pain. Just shoot me now so I don't ruin the family. Is it possible that you have lost your identity as anything other than being a sick person? Yes, I've lost my identity. I don't care about myself anymore. While other moms are soccer moms, my mom is sleeping sick complaining instead of just trying to be there for her kids. Don't you dare say don't I don't you... love you. Don't you dare say that to me. How dare you when I have killed myself to make sure you get the help you need for our family. Trina, How dare you? you? Mom, abused don't me talk to me. For 10 years. Do you need to sit down and listen no. to your daughter? If you walk off this stage, our relationship is done. You've done it to me so many times, Shariah. Do you remember walking out of my life? Do you remember having sex with someone else with other than your husband and getting pregnant and leaving your kids? Stop yelling at me. I'm or so I'm... mad, Mom. Do you not see how mad I am? You 
can get your life back. I don't want my life back. I feel robbed of the mother of my children and the wife that I married. She's so over-medicated. Oh, my God, this woman's a zombie. We've got to get her some coping skills to deal with this and get her back into her life. I want to medicate. I want to look at her. My greatest fear is that she would take her own life. I do fear that if she doesn't get some help, I will be one of those mothers that will bury their child. People on heroin hate being addicted, but they will step over their mother's dead body to get to the next fix. This woman is addicted to being sick. Shemita, I am going to offer you help and resources. And if I make those resources available to you, are you willing to participate? So did Shemita take the help or did the momentum of her pathology win out? National. Girl, what's your name? I have to know. Ain't no one else in your lane. Let's fill this car with gas and go. No hesitation, I'm on it. If that's the way that you want it, that's cool with me, so let's ride. Let's go somewhere that you lie. We'll find out after the break. <laughs> So did Shabita take the help or continue her destructive path? Here's an update on what has been happening since the show. After the show, I was very scared. I really just felt like I didn't know what to expect. My first few days of treatment was a shock to me. She had come in with so many issues and taking so many medications. I went to a hospital. I came off substances that I didn't realize were addictive. They said that I was on some dangerous combinations of medications. I felt I had been deceived by multiple doctors that I trusted for many years. We were shocked with the medication she was taking. With the medical evaluations, we realized that more than half of the medication she was taking was not necessary. My pill box was my friend. I was on 30 medications when I started, and now I'm down to nine medications. The biggest revelation I had in treatment was that I was a prescription drug addict. As I've spent time at Creative Care, it has allowed me to get the resources I need. They've given me the tools to recover. I haven't been wearing my wigs the past couple weeks because everybody said they liked my natural hair, so I thought I'd give it a try. Hello Kitty is still a passion of mine, and that's gonna stick around. I love Hello Kitty, and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> Creative Care has helped restore me to health. Feels great. I feel so much stronger. I don't feel sick. It's been wonderful. I have more of a voice, and I'm gonna set boundaries when I go back home. I will be able to stand up for myself, not just with family, but with, with everyone. My family and I are still in the process of healing. My husband is elated with my change. He's ready for me to come home so that we can be a family again. I also saw my parents. They said I look like a different person. They're just glad to have their baby back. I have not seen my daughter. I do look forward to seeing my daughter soon, though. She's my princess. I look forward to the relationships uh, with all my children when I get out because they'll have a healthier mother when I go home. I want to build a new life for us. I love my family with all my heart. Wow. I have to say, and I hope all of you watch and realize what a huge and amazing turnaround that is. Uh, for Shemita, we're talking about someone that was so deep into the pathology of just being sick and on so many medications and to make that kind of turnaround. Did you see the natural smile on her face and hear the forward thinking that she was doing? That is huge. So uh, kudos to her for the courage to fight back like that. And what a very special thank you to the great team at Creative Care in Malibu for taking such great care of Shamita. Creative Care, well done, Creative Care.
With the holidays right around the corner, my wife Robin has something very special for all the women to help make this time of year the most magical yet. Yes, so in the spirit of the holidays, everyone in the audience is going home with my new perfume, Georgia. <laughs> And if you want to purchase your own Georgia fragrance, and guys, it smells amazing, go to RobinMcGrawRevelation.com. I want to thank all of my guests today. Have a happy holiday. We'll see you next time.